Blog Talk Radio. Context of white supremacy. Gus T. Renegade in for another program to share constructive information on what racism, white supremacy is, and how it works. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to the broadcast. Um, again, I hope you are getting constructive, useful information uh, from the program. Uh, if you do not find the information uh, to be of value, Please do not waste your time listening. We do not want black people wasting time. We got way too many things to do, way too many problems to address. So I only want folks listening in if you feel like the program is of constructive value. Uh, We want to get started because we have a lot of information to cover. But before I get started, I do want to say uh, happy birthday to Khadijah. She is an investor, longtime listener. Uh, in fact, we did a birthday wish last year on the same date. So happy birthday. I hope the day has been uh, outstanding. Uh, today's guest uh, was a recommendation from uh, Mr. Nero. Uh, he thought uh, she would have a lot of uh, just fantastic information to share with us. And uh, I concur, having read her book. Um, our guest, Uh, She is a graduate of the Harvard Medical School, uh, trained in surgery, obstetrics, excuse me, obstetrics, I think I did say that correctly, uh, gynecology, uh, gynecological oncology. Uh, She practiced general obstetrics and gynecology for 25 years. Uh, In addition, she earned an MBA in finance. Uh, She lives in Maryland. Uh, where she writes and lectures on health and wellness. Uh, She is the author of AIDS, Opium, Diamonds, and Empire, the Deadly Virus of International Greed. Uh, Just to kind of set the table for you, uh, this is from page four of her book. Uh, She writes, AIDS is not a disease. It is a syndrome a collection of 29 old diseases clustered together, rebranded, and given a new scary label. It is a product marketed by fear, deception, and the creation of mass hysteria. It has been selling well for 25 years. Real pleasure to have her on the program. I think you will be thoroughly impressed. Uh, Our guest for today's program, uh, Dr. Nancy Turner Banks. Uh, Dr. Banks, are you with us? I am. Hello to everyone out there. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing uh, a bit of your Monday evening with us. As I said, it's it's just a real privilege to have you on the program. Um, I guess for, for folks, if they aren't familiar with your work, if they haven't read your book, could you give them a little bit of background information? I wrote this book. I, I wanted to write a book about what is happening in the world generally, especially in terms of the issues of globalization, 
but I'm a physician and I know something about finance. So I, I used AIDS as a metaphor for a lot of the things that are going on uh, in the world today. Um, and I really also wanted to talk about the AIDS issue because uh, I saw it as another uh, attack against black women. Uh, it started out 25 years ago as largely a disease that was focused on homosexual males. And then all of a sudden, I started hearing that, that it was a disease of, of black women. And that, from an epidemiological point of view, in terms of how diseases actually spread, it didn't make any sense to me. Before that, I hadn't really looked into it, and I just listened to what the uh, pharmaceutical industry and the other physicians were saying. So I didn't have really an insight into it. And I thought, like everybody else, it was a virus. It was killing people. And that was that. Uh, but as I began to look into it, I found that it was much deeper than that. Hmm. Wow. Um, and I, we'll get into that depth uh, as we move through the program. Um, I guess for my listeners, if they have not seen you, uh, you are a black female. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, this program, uh, the context of white supremacy, uh, I have unfortunately concluded that we are in a global system of racism white supremacy, and the definition that I use for both terms, I use them as synonyms interchangeably, uh, is as follows. Uh, a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Um, do you believe that such a system exists, and do you think that definition is accurate? No, I see it a little bit differently. I I see it because I don't – because remember, one of the things I talk about in my book is the Second World War. These people killed 100 million of their own people during the Second World War. And so it's really – I see it more as an elitist kind of issue. Now, they use race and class to separate us. And I think that as black people, we need to honor who we are, and we need to be clear about who we are. But the people who are running this game, they don't care what color people are. They use religion, class, and race to separate everybody. And if they have to kill their own people to get what they want, they will do it. Hmm. Are the people running this game white people? Most of them are, yes. But it's even it's even more than that, and and another time off the air, I'll talk to you about it. Okay, that's that is a deal. Okay, um, your book again, uh, AIDS, Opium, Diamonds, and Empire. Um, what was your purpose uh, in putting this book together? Uh, basically, I wanted to do an expose of how the healthcare system is being used to really harm people. And when I, because as I began to look at this, I was really appalled. I was appalled that I was actually part of a system that might have been harming people. And I really wanted to give people information so that they wouldn't be in a panic because I know that if someone has a positive HIV test, they, first of all, they think they're, they have a, a virus. Secondly, they think they have a virus that's going to kill them. And thirdly, the doctors are going to want to put them on medication, which in fact can kill them. And so, and, and then fourthly, in the black community especially, we are not talking about it. And so people are frightened and they don't know where to turn. So my goal in writing this book was really to give people a sense that they're not alone, that they're not going to die, there, so there are things that they can do, and this is also for them to start thinking a little bit more about what is happening, uh, especially with the drug issue, um, which is one of the things, the opium part of it, and then, of course, the diamond part of it has to do with Africa. So I wanted to, especially for African Americans, to start thinking globally about their issues. Mm, wow. Okay. Um in reading the book, one of the one of the main points that I took away from this, uh, and you, you've already said it, um, you do not see evidence that there is a virus causing the what is called AIDS, uh, that it fits the pattern that would be closer to a non-contagious 
chemical uh, stressor. Um, exactly. Okay. Could you could you explain that for our audience? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, over a hundred years ago, the the medical community uh, set up protocols for isolation of bacteria. Then, in, and viruses, of course, are much smaller than um, bacteria. <clears throat> so, in the 1960s, when they developed a, a a laboratory item called an electron microscope that they were allowed to that they could use to identify very tiny particles. The protocol was adjusted uh, for that electron microscope, and there were a few extra steps that they had to go through. But essentially, when you isolate a bacteria, isolation means that you separate it from something else. But part of the isolation process is that you have to prove that that particular organism is the infectious organism, and then you have to put it into another specimen and make sure that it actually is infective. And and they never did that. They never isolated by their own standard protocols. And we now have, and I and I have it in the book, we have evidence from the researchers that worked with the Dr. Gallo, who was supposedly had isolated this. We have evidence from the other researchers that worked for, with him that he never isolated. We have uh, some papers that were found in the National Archives and letters from the doctor who was the who took the electron microscope a picture that all he had on his specimen was debris. But what he did is that he took when people are sick they make uh, proteins called antibodies, and so the people who were sick their antibodies were more elevated. And he identified a few of those antibodies, and he patented a test called the HIV antibody test, and he brought that to market even before he published those four articles. And so from the very beginning, the science was a bit, it was bogus. Wow. Um, now, the important thing for people to understand also, because when they say that they are having an HIV test, they think they are having a test that directly identifies the virus, but it's not. It's an antibody test. It's an indirect test. It identifies antibodies, and antibodies are proteins which are able to protect you from an infection. Now, in African Americans, the, the, well, first of all, this antibody cross-reacts with 70 different things, which you will see in the beginning of my book, which the doctors never tell patients. For example, they're telling everybody now to get a flu shot, but the flu shot cross-reacts with the HIV antibody test. So if you have just recently had a flu shot and you get this test, how do you know you have just a reaction from the antibody, from the, from the flu shot? The other thing is black people, like we have darker skin, we also make more antibodies than Caucasians. And then one of the, the proteins that they identified is more common also in black people. And so they used the test. They, they made a test to make it look like black people are more often positive. It's, they just used something that we do normally. They used some genetic markers and designed a test to make it look like we're more often positive. Uh, for folks out there, uh, and you can get the book. Her website, it's linked in the description for this program, uh, the website, nancybanksmd.com. It's linked in the description for this program. Uh, you can just click her name. It'll take you right to her website. Please get the book. It is filled with outstanding, informative, uh, just tons of information uh, about AIDS, and I, I highly recommend it. Um, one of the first things that you'll bump into, as she just talked about, uh, factors known to cause false positive HIV antibody test results. Uh, I looked at the first page and was like, wow, that's a lot. And then I flipped the page and was like, oh, my gosh, you go to the next page. Um, just to give folks out there who are listening an idea, um, some of these factors, uh, the flu, as she mentioned, flu vaccination, herpes simplex 1, herpes simplex 2, uh, hepatitis B vaccination, uh, organ transplantation, uh, I mean, you got tons of stuff here, hepatitis, sticky blood, put that in quotes. Um, I mean, with all of these different factors, it seems like there are a myriad of things that could cause a false positive test result when you go to be tested for HIV. Is that accurate? Well, that is that is accurate. So 
be, so the three things that people need to remember, the test could be a false positive, that black people, off, it, the epidemiology, again, shows that black people are, are more positive about five times more than whites. Now, what does that mean? If this is a sexually transmitted disease, you have to assume that black people are that much more sexually active, which is an absurdity. And so then you have to say there must be something else besides sex that's causing this particular problem. And, of course, that's something else that I found. But, again, it's the, the number of antibodies that people make and this other issue, which is a really big issue, that they used another uh, protein that blacks more often have on their cells to identify blacks and to make it look like blacks are more positive. Wow. So it was really this. It was it it, it it's uh, one of the things as you know as you go through the book. I talk about eugenics and I talk about e eugenics as a way of culling the population. And so this has been directed um, at such a way that it could reduce the population. Would it be accurate to say, particularly to reduce the population of non-white people, black people? Yeah, both. Uh, yes, I, I would definitely go along with that because it, it has been directed at Africa. And what happened in Africa is most of the diseases that they're call, that calling AIDS in Africa are, again, old diseases like tuberculosis. And um, what happens in Africa is many times they don't even do an antibody test. They do the World Health Organization established something called the Bangui definition, which is just some nonspecific uh, symptoms. It's a, a fever, weight loss of 10%, diarrhea, and a cough of one month's duration. Now, that could be any number of problems. That could be malaria, tuberculosis. It could be a parasite infection. It could be, you know, um, it, it could just be the diarrhea. It could be any number of things. So they're calling that nonspecific, those nonspecific symptoms, AIDS. And so they're making it look like people are dying from AIDS when they're dying from poverty and bad water and poor nutrition. Wow. <clears throat> wow. Could you could you explain what iatrogenic deaths, could you explain what that means and how that relates to HIV AIDS? Well, iatrogenic deaths are deaths that are caused by the medical community themselves, either by the doctors and nurses or by the drugs that people are, are given. And one of the things that I found is that, um, especially the first drug that they came out with, something called AZT, AZT was a cancer drug which had been shelved because it caused cancer. It was it was a, a drug that they were going to use to treat cancer, but they never used it because it was highly toxic and it could cause cancer. Yet, without a real double-blind uh, study, which is the traditional way of deciding whether a medication can be put on the market, they started using this drug, and this drug actually started killing people. And when in the early days of the AIDS crisis, a lot of times when you saw people that were losing weight, that, that were losing their hair, that were having diarrhea, people thought that those, that was the AIDS. But a lot of times that was the, the, a, the complications of the AZT that they were taking. Wow. And just from the information that you've gathered in doing this book, um, would you say it's accurate to say that the, the so-called treatments of HIV AIDS have killed uh, a significant number of people who've been diagnosed with this problem? They have, and what is happening now is that there seem to be more people dying from the complication of the so-called antiretroviral drugs than are dying from AIDS. They're now dying from uh, heart, uh, heart disease, from liver failure, and from kidney failure. Those are not AIDS-defining diseases. Those are complications from the drugs, but what they tell when the when the people die, what they're telling the families, oh, your your loved one died of AIDS, and they're not really telling the truth about what the cause of these deaths are. Hmm. I suspect that a 
major motivating reason and the deception and with regards to what they tell patients or family members, loved ones who uh, succumb to this to this disease or the treatment is uh, profit. I think that's a that's a refrain in your book. This is just business. Um, can it's you just kind of- business. It's just business. It's just business. That's you know one of the things I I say over and over again that the, the the people who are running these companies and these major organizations are psychopaths. They really don't care about humans as the uh, ordinary people care about each other. And the 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 mistake that we make is thinking that they have ordinary values like other human beings. They don't. They have a profit motive, and their whole goal in life is to make the bottom line. And whether people are harmed or not, they don't really seem to care. As a matter of fact, they have uh, actuarial tables where they they discount the, the cost of a life. For example, just one drug um, that was taken off the market about a year or so ago called Vioxx. It was a drug that they put on the market for people with, uh, it was an anti-inflammatory, people who had arthritis or pain. Now, they knew that that drug has caused cardiac problems before they put it on the market. But they they put it on the market. They made a lot of money. In the meantime, they 50,000 people died of heart attacks and 100,000 people were injured. But they made their profit. Wow. Wow. Um, I guess, okay, okay. Can you... I guess can you share a little bit because the title threw me off a little bit. I would I would like it if you could connect the dots between AIDS and opium for our listeners. Okay, when when I first started doing the research, there there's a a, a, a very well respected virologist. This is a a PhD doctor who specializes in learning about viruses. And his name was Peter Duthberg, and he was, I believe, at the University of California at Berkeley. And he was at the top of his field. Uh, he had uh, grants, he had grad students, and then when this AIDS thing came out, he stated. The, the retro he looked at retroviruses because this HIV they said was a retrovirus, and I don't want to get into the science here because I don't think it's so important, and I talk about it somewhat in my book. But he said these retroviruses are not pathological in man; they just don't cause any damage. But what they did with Peter is that he lost his graduate students, he lost his funding and they stopped publishing his articles in journals. So that's how they control people. Wow. I think uh, in your book, you also talk about and make a a strong connection, not just with, with opium, but with drugs in general, pharmaceutical companies and individuals who sell drugs, be it, uh, the Bush family, Oliver North, the whole Iran Contra scandal. Well, well, Duisberg, uh, this gets me back to the point. Duisberg wrote a book called Inventing AIDS. And in his book, he he said that the, the AIDS crisis was a subset of the drug crisis. And so when I started looking at the importation of drugs in the United States, I had to take it all the way back in history to a company called the British East India Company. And so what I found is that some of the elites in the United States uh, such as the Roosevelt and the Astors and the Russells and the Lowe's and the Lowell's. And many of these people, not only were they involved in the slave trade, when that got to be too difficult, they got involved in the drug trade, the opium trade. So opium money has been very important in the development of industrial capitalism because it was the seed money to finance the railroads and a lot of the industry that grew up in the West uh, after uh, the, you know, after the, after the slave era. So drug money has never stopped being a major part of the capital flows of the West. As a matter of fact, 
during the 2008 financial world financial crisis, the, the uh, United Nations reported that drug money was the money that was keeping the international banks afloat. Wow. So people think of it, you know, they think of drugs as like the kids on the corner selling retail. But we're talking about international banking. We're talking about logistics. We're talking about transportation. We're talking about insurance. And we're talking about a clandestine agency. So we're talking about major businesses at a very high level in the drug trade. Wow. Now they so they pushed the, the, the British pushed the drugs into China because the British was wanted to trade with China, but they the Chinese did, didn't want the British had nothing that the Chinese wanted. So the British hit upon the idea of addicting the Chinese. And so they fought two wars with the, the Chinese, the opium wars, to push the drugs into China. The people who ran this trade, for the most part, kept the drugs out of the West until the Vietnam War. Until around the time of the Vietnam War, they started bringing those drugs into the West. And first it was the um, in the 50s and 60s, the CIA ran programs where they started getting the scene accustomed to using drugs. So they started introducing things like LSD and marijuana. And then, of course, when the, the veterans came back from Vietnam, they introduced heroin. And then uh, about a decade later, it was Iran-Contra, and then it was cocaine. Wow. You uh, you started the program and you said you wanted black people to begin thinking more globally about things that are happening. And I think that that is definitely true with uh, the drug trade. Can you talk about uh, the term you use in your book, planned shrinkage, and how that relates to uh, the drug trade and particularly people who have a long term view of what drugs are supposed to do to a community? Well, one of the things that happened after the civil rights movement, and uh, it was clear that, that blacks were going to begin to get their civil rights in this country, there, there, you can, there are some reports that you can find that, that think tanks, such as the RAND Institute, and these, are, these generally are think tanks that are associated with the Pentagon, started producing papers about how to control minority communities. And so one of the ways they decided was that they would do something called planned shrinkage and benign neglect. So what they did is that in, especially in urban areas, as the whites moved out into the suburbs and, and blacks moved into certain areas, they started carving up apartments and making, say, an apartment that had one family. Now that same apartment might have two or three families. So you had a much denser population. At the same time, they cut back services. They cut back sanitation, police, and fire services. At the same time, uh, during that period, they were beginning to release people from psychiatric institutions. And so you started seeing homeless people on the street and simultaneously, they started bringing drugs into these communities. So it was, it was really almost a military attack on minority urban communities that had been viable and healthy. I hope you all heard that a military attack on non-white black communities. Um, and, and this relates directly to... Uh, I guess urban renewal projects, put that in quotes, um, that I think are still going on in so-called gentrification projects. Is that accurate? Well, one of the things, there was a, a woman who was the um, undersecretary of housing and urban development in the Reagan administration. Her name is uh, Catherine Austin Fitz. And she really is brilliant. And I, I, if people could read her stuff, she really tells, she really talks about how the money works. She was an investment banker before she went to the government. And then when she left the government, she started making, she wanted to, to 
figure out a way how to get ordinary people involved in getting government contracts and how the government could get a higher return on their investment. She was like, she was really a person of integrity. So she started developing this software that she could identify how government money was used in communities. And she was using the people in the communities, in the HUD housing, to actually develop this software rather than, you know, farm it out to these, you know, these these government contractors who charge an arm and a leg. Mm. So what she found when she was doing this is that she found that the 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 black areas in say uh Los Angeles, Washington DC, New York were being intentionally targeted with the drugs and then what happened is that people, of course, if your neighborhood is going to the dogs, even you're, you're going to sell your piece of property or walk away from it at a, at a loss. And so what was happening is that the housing and urban development hub was coming in to these neighborhoods and buying up tracts of property for pennies on the dollar, knowing that these neighborhoods were going to be gentrified in the future. So those, those, uh, port, those, uh, properties went into portfolios, for example, into Harvard's portfolio, where the person from Harvard was also a head of DynCor, which is one of those corporations that were targeting the neighborhoods. And so they knew, because they were inside of the government, which neighborhoods they wanted to gentrify. So they put those packaged loans, which they were, say, were buying a house for pennies on the dollar, and they knew that those those uh, mortgages were going to appreciate in value as people came in uh, to gentrify those areas. Wow, racial dislocation, folks. Racial. So it's, it's very slick, and and that's why that's one of the reasons I don't want people. I want people to start. You know, if you if and that's why I didn't get into the the race thing because I want people to start thinking strategically. And, and if you, in how I feel, and I may be wrong, if you spend all your time thinking about race, sometimes you're, you're going to miss the big picture because there are strategic things going on here which people can learn how to recognize, to arm themselves again and against, and to begin to start thinking in a in a way that will protect themselves and their communities a little bit better. I'm all for that, all for protection. Um, let me give the website one more time so folks, uh, please get the book filled with outstanding information. The website is nancybanksmd.com. And, again, if you're at Blog Talk Radio, just click her name, take you right to her website, you can get a copy of the book. Um, as I was reading, I it was really it was startling to me because I had not made the connection between – uh, using drugs, and that might cause what is termed AIDS. And you talk about that in your book. Can you share that connection with our audience? Well, they've known for over 100 years. You, I went back about 100 years in the medical literature. So they've known for over 100 years that opiates, um, opium, heroin, morphine, were immunosuppressive. It was written about 100 years ago. They said that it, it, it uh, people who, who use these drugs chronically, first of all, opium smokers in China were, heavy opium smokers were dead in about five years. But people who were using the opiates in the West, they, they got a lot of infections and they were immune suppressed and their white blood cells, which was one of the characteristics of this so-called AIDS, their right white blood cells were low. So they already knew this for 100 years. So so what was the big deal when they started finding a lot of guys who were taking a lot of different drugs and having a wild lifestyle instead of recognizing that these young people were toxic and needed to be detoxified, they started saying that it was a virus. But these people were toxic. They were toxic from all these drugs and the immune suppressors that they had been taking. And this is what it's hard for, you know, because so many, we, 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 the, our environment is filled with so many toxins today that we don't even think about how we're being slowly poisoned. 
And then on top of that, if, if, if people start taking these drugs on a regular basis to top it off with all the other toxins, it's just a disaster waiting to happen. Wow. Wow. And again, uh, you said the, uh, what is called AIDS, uh, it is characteristic of something that is caused that is non-contagious uh, and more symptomatic of a chemical or physical stressor. Is that correct? Exact. Exactly. Okay. Wow. I, I definitely wanted to wanted you to share some of the information that you write about in the book about uh, Henry Kissinger, and I, I want people to keep this in mind. All that complaining and griping that was going on about President Obama when he won the uh, Nobel Peace Prize last year, Henry Kissinger won the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Keep that in mind uh, as Dr. Banks shares some information about uh, Mr. Kissinger. Yeah, unfortunately, I think the Nobel Peace Prize has been very discredited. Um, but Kissinger is, I think, one of probably – Kissinger, I think, is a prototype for – the type of people who are running the planet. And I think if you look at his history and look at the things that he's been involved in, you really get an understanding of um, how unscrupulous this group of people are. And, and Kissinger, from the, from the time he came here, where did he come from? Who brought him here? How did he get all of this power? These are very important questions. But he was, he was Nixon's handler. But he was responsible for uh, for the Vietnam War extending because uh, they were trying to stop the Vietnam War, and he went behind uh, he went behind the scenes and made sure that that war would go on for another four years. And why did they want to extend that war? Because that war was planned to bring drugs into the United States and to, to give China a bigger sphere of influence in Southeast Asia because he was making a deal with China at the same time China was supplying the weapons to the Viet Cong. Then Kissinger was involved in the, he was involved in the bombing in Laos and Cambodia. He was involved in uh, Pinochet in Chile and the killing of all of those people. He was involved in a lot of the the overthrow uh, of the governments in, in Central America, and he also was involved in the 1970s in that big oil embargo that, that actually was a, a scheme by the oil companies to basically rob the planet. They, they simply stopped shipping oil and claimed it was the Arabs, and then they jacked up the price, and everybody had to pay. Uh, Mr. Kissinger, to, to your knowledge, uh, is he involved in tactics to uh, what is called population control, specifically aimed at non-white people? Well, Kissinger wrote a very important, when he was, I think, Secretary of State, wrote a very important memo, National Security Memorandum 200, which states specifically that they needed to decrease the rate of population in certain countries, and he named countries in uh, Africa and South America. They wanted to decrease the populations because he felt if there are too many young people in these countries, it was not in the strategic interest of the West. Basically, what he was saying is that the, the, these countries have natural resources that the, the West wants, they think they need, and they don't want to pay for. Wow. Wow. Uh, when he says the West, is he talking about white people? He's talking about the corporations. He's talking about Western corporations that are largely run by Europeans, yes. Wow. But remember, they remember, you know, one of the things, for example, in Africa, what they do you know, one of the people I talk about is Maurice Templesman, and Maurice Templesman uh, was a diamond merchant. He was an economic hitman for, for the Oppenheimers of South Africa who controlled the diamond and gold mines. But he was also involved in the overthrow, uh, the murder of, Kwame, uh, of uh, Patrice Lumumba, and the overthrow of Kwame Nkrumah and about four or five other African countries. 
So these people operate, they're big players, they operate behind the scenes, and they install the puppet masters in order for them to be able to get whatever resources they want wherever. So they use, you know, they'll use a proxy like Mobutu mm. or right now Paul Kagame um, or Lawrence Kabila in order to, to control their own people so that they could steal the resources. Wow. Wow. Uh, again, our guest for today's program, uh, Dr. Nancy Turner Banks. Um, you, in your book, you you talk a lot uh, about Africa, um, and I mean, of course, if you're going to talk about AIDS, um, can you talk about the diamond and gold mines and what that has to do with AIDS? The um, the the diamond and gold mines, as I said before, are largely run by a family by the name of Oppenheimer, and they are very much uh, connected to Israel, and they the the diamond industry is run. Uh, largely through Tel Aviv, Belgium, and New York out of South Africa. And they were a group of people who were largely responsible for the the whole apartheid system being put in place. Now, the diamond and the gold is embedded in in materials that are damaging to the, the lung, silica and asbestos. And these particular uh, particulates can cause damage to the lung, and you can develop uh, congestive uh, po- congestive uh, lung failure, or also you can develop uh, cancer. But secondarily, from these damages, you can develop something uh, a lung infection called tuberculosis. So what happened in uh, the early 90s, at the when the apartheid uh, government was falling. Suddenly, pulmonary tuberculosis, which is tuberculosis of the lung, became an AIDS-defining disease. Now, you see the absurdity of that because they're saying tuberculosis is a sexually transmitted disease. That's very absurd. But the reason this was is because now these black miners that apartheid was over, these black miners might have their day in court. Because before, under the apartheid system, they had no recourse to the courts. But now that apartheid was over, they might have recourse to the courts to get some uh, damages from their uh, harm that occurred to them in the mine. But if you say you have a sexually transmitted disease, then, of course, the person who owns the mine has no fear of any future damages. Um, I, I know, I remember, um, when the 1980s, uh, when AIDS was, was beginning to be talked about a lot in the media, uh, the genesis that was reported was this came from a monkey virus in Africa. Um, can you talk about the, uh, the absurdity of, of this myth? Well, that's the, you know, what the biggest part of, of the biggest part of everything is mind control. You know, there are two ways to control people. One is through guns and violence, and the other is through the mind. And if you control people's minds, it's the easy way, because they basically will control themselves. So what happened is that in, in, is that when AIDS first started, there was no talk of AIDS coming from Africa. And so they were talking about AIDS for about four or five years, and all of a sudden, there was a meeting in, I think, Paris or Vienna, and then they decided it was going to be an African problem. Uh, So all of a sudden, Time magazine, every New York Times, all these major magazines started showing you uh, skinny Africans that looked like they were sick and dying. Well, of course, they were sick and dying because because they weren't getting the food and nutrition that they needed and because a lot of these people were being taken, uh, chased off of their land by mercenaries, especially if the land had any gold, silver, or oil, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so 
they weren't really telling you the full story of what was going on in Africa. They were just showing you a lot of pathetic people who looked like they were sick and telling you that it was AIDS. And so it was a, a whole psychological operation that was mounted to make people think that Africa was dying of AIDS when Africa was really dying of the, the, the conflicts that were brought on by the world bankers and the debt repayment that they had to undergo as a result of taking out these fraudulent loans by these dictators that were put in place by the bankers. Mm. Uh, I think uh, you talked about psychological warfare. Um, in your book, you, you and you already mentioned that uh, what's piqued some of your interest in studying uh, what is termed AIDS, um, that this is being tossed at black females and saying, hey, black females are the main carriers of this. Um, you talked in your book about how this, this another aspect of this was just the term gorilla and the definition that was used for that and how that also relates to the perception of Africa and how people don't really feel moved or any sympathy for what happens there because these people are not really regarded as human beings. They're subhumans. They're closer to apes and monkeys. Um, can you just share a little bit of that definition? For well, me? that was, you know, when I heard that, I said, oh, here we go again, because that, you know, that, this looks like the eugenics crowd is up to their old game. And basically, the, the Webster's Dictionary of a Gorilla is a tribe of hairy women uh, that they discovered in Africa, which is nonsense. Why is that even in the, why is that even in the dictionary? In, in, you know, in 2010, why is that still in the dictionary? And the dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, is very interesting, and I think people should go through it and look at some of those definitions. But so... Then they started talking about monkeys, monkeys and black people. So I said, oh, here we go, Tarzan again. And so when you look at it, it was like they were just they were just speculating. It was not even scientific. They were just talking off the top of their heads, and people were reporting it as if it had some scientific validity. They didn't know what they were talking about. They were talking about a, a particular species of monkey might have a similar virus, but then that monkey didn't come from Africa. It came from Southeast Asia. And then they were they were talking about Haitians uh, who were in Africa, but, in, but when the Haitians got it in Africa, it was because they were heterosexual. But then when they went to Haiti, they had sex with gay men, and then they were homosexual. They were, it, it was just they were talking pure nonsense. And this was the kind of stuff that was passing for science. But the media took that and was putting it out there as if it had some validity. And people began to believe it. And once that, that sort of image was etched in people's minds, even in the black community now, you, you have this idea without really having them look to look at what's going on in Africa that Africa is dying of AIDS. No, Africa is not dying of AIDS. Africa is dying of an onslaught of European madness where they think they have to have what Africa has and they will do anything to get it, the same as they did during slavery. Wow. Uh, was another part of this uh, pseudoscience that uh, circumcision, female, uh, female circumcision in Africa was, was also uh, contributing to the so-called AIDS crisis? Oh yeah, they tried to say it was they they tried to say oh it was a female circumcision, but it turned out that those those communities that actually did female circumcision uh, didn't have any AIDS. So so they just kept throwing things out. It was just it was one thing after another. None of it made any scientific sense. Wow, <laughs> wow. Um, I, it was it was real important. I thought in uh, in your book you and you've already uh, talked about uh, involvement of uh, white people in the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, uh, the only democratically elected uh, leader of the Congo. I think it's uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo now. Um, in that area, a lot of black people are uh, just dying, millions. And you're not really seeing a lot of media attention around that. Can you talk about some of the contributing factors as for why that is? The, the Congo is resource rich. The Congo has uh, cobalt, um, oil, coltan. Now, cobalt is used in the space program, and coltan is a, a, something that is used in the computer industry. And apparently, these these elements among 
others are found almost exclusively in that area of the Congo. Um, it, it, of course, it has diamonds, it has gold, uh, and plus it has land. It has good land that is fertile. And so over the last 10 years, it has been uh, reported that perhaps up to 8 million people have been slaughtered in the Congo, and there has been barely a peep about this slaughter in the Western press. There has been hardly any discussion that I've seen in the, the so-called black media. Uh, with regards to the black media, do you think that's that mind control has been so effective that a lot of black people have that same lack of regard for what happens in Africa as well? I think that many of the people who um, own black media or control black media have the have they're not identifying at all with Africa. They've turned away from Africa. And all of those ideas that, that the community had during the civil – and as a matter of fact, people are, are attacked. For example, uh, look what happened to Reverend Wright. Mm. So, so, this, so the idea – see, the, the, I, you, can, you, can be, you can have um, Irish pride and Italian pride and Jewish pride, and you can have any pride. But if you have black pride, somehow that black pride is, is – considered racist, but you can have pride in every other country that you come from. And as a matter of fact, people have, in New York, if you live in New York, you have a Pulaski Day Parade, and you have a Puerto Rican Day Parade, and you have an Israel Day Parade, and you have uh, the St. Patrick's Day Parade, on, on and on and on. But if you begin as an African American, if you if you begin to to, to talk about your culture and your history, it seems to be threatening. But I think the reason it's threatening because that, that people really understand the power and the history that has come out of Africa that basically has been stolen and used uh, to take over the world. Double whammy. Uh, context of white supremacy. Um, I want to snatch a few of the folks that called in to uh, see if they have any questions. Is that acceptable if we take a few callers, Dr. Banks? Sure, absolutely. Okay. I want to make sure I give the, the web address again. Uh, the address, <clears throat> nancybanksmd.com. Again, nancybanksmd.com. Dot com. If you're listening here at Blog Talk Radio, you can just click her name and it'll take you right to the website. Please get a copy of the book, AIDS, Opium, Diamonds, and Empire. Um, person who called in, 0775, she's the first person to ring in, 0775. Did you have a question for Dr. Banks? Yes, you have Philadelphia on the line again. How are you today? I'm great. You Thank you for calling in. Great. I have one statement and um, two questions. First of all, I'm a soldier to fall on the front lines in the uh, war in Iraq. Every time I go to the VA, they offer me assortment of drugs. I have um, comrades who have been treated, drugged up. They've had every disease known, and they've basically fallen apart. So I believe everything she says about um, the drug industry. Secondly, I just want to know, one, uh, what, um, what are some of the names of the scholarly um, papers that you've written, white papers, papers that have been published in other medical journals. And two, what can I do, you know, consuming, consuming this food that's mass produced by industry to protect myself from the, um, from the bacteria? And um, I don't think it's, um, like you said, it's not viruses, but from the bacteria, the AIDS bacteria or whatever. Oh, good, good question. Um, that, if you go to my website, there are some articles that I've written, but I haven't. the The book that I've written is is my major publication. I've mostly written for the lay journals and not for the professional journals, because okay. my goal is really teaching ordinary people uh, to how to better to take care of themselves. Now, the question that you ask is, how can you build up your immune system? 
And I think that's an excellent question because that's the key to staying healthy is how, what do you need to build up your immune system? And there, there are a couple of things that, that I'm going to recommend that people don't usually, and, but these are only the beginning. First of all, people need to hydrate themselves well. Almost nobody ever thinks about water, drinking enough water. Our bodies are 70 to 80% water, and most people drink everything but water. Okay. So maintaining hydration is key. For African Americans, there is a there is an epidemic of vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D has been shown to decrease cancer, decrease heart attacks, decrease diabetes, and also it's associated with a decreased risk of flu and viruses in the fall when instead of getting a flu shot, it would be better to keep your vitamin D level uh at, a, at an adequate level. So I, I suggest that people take vitamin D with calcium. And then another nutrient that is very important, especially for detoxing your liver, is something called NAC or N-acetylcysteine. And it's a precursor to a molecule called glutathione, which is really the deficit in most of the people who go on to develop AIDS. And so if you take a good multiple vitamin with minerals and you take a few additional nutrients uh, plus exercise and, and making sure this person is a soldier, and I'm sure she probably has some mental issues dealing with oh, yeah. her, her time in the military, is try to make sure that you have a support system so that you can de-stress and detoxify your your spiritual system as well. Well, what are some um, natural ways that you get that last? You said glutathione. What are some natural foods? Glutathione, but the precursor to that is something called NAC. You don't have to remember the whole thing. If you go to the health food store and you ask for N as in Nancy, A as in Ann, C as in Candy, NAC, that's the precursor molecule, and that's that's what you need. So the thing, because that is going to help to detoxify your liver, and something like milk thistle is also uh, also a good detoxifier of your liver. The problem is also with with somebody who's been in the military, you have got probably so many vaccines and mercury. Mm-hmm that you probably need to see a nutritionist about uh, doing other kinds of detoxification. Okay. Thank you uh, very much, caller in Philadelphia. I appreciate it. She was one of the first folks to dial in. Um, Person who called in from a blocked number. Uh, Did you have a question, blocked number? Yes, I do. Hi, uh, Dr. Banks. I appreciate the information that you are giving. Um, I would like to know who specifically are the people that control the World Health Organization and the World Bank as far as some of the the big names, which people in particular, and do those people also run the state of Israel? Well, one of the people who was at the World Bank who was just in, who just left the President Obama's administration was Larry Summers. And when Larry was at the World Bank, he wrote a very interesting memo that he said it was okay because Africa was underpolluted, it was okay to dump pollution in Africa. And, of course, then they started dumping all this pollution off the coast of Somalia, and then the the young people started becoming what they called pirates, but they weren't pirates. They were trying to protect their shoreline because all this, uh, radioactive material and all this garbage is running, uh, washing up on shore and polluting their beaches and, and making their children sick. So Larry Summers is one of those people. They just, and these people get recycled. So Larry, uh, Larry Summers goes from the World Bank. He was the treasurer at the World Bank. Then he goes to Harvard. Then he comes to the Obama administration. And now he's going back to Harvard. So he was one of the people that was responsible for destroying the economy of Russia and bringing all those oligarchs, and he's pretty much doing the same thing to this economy as well. So these people just get recycled and rewarded. You know, people like Donald Rumsfeld. Donald Rumsfeld was the head of Theral, 
uh, Pharmaceuticals, and then he also has a lot of stock in something called Gilead Pharmaceuticals, which is Gilead makes uh, HIV medication. They make these flu drugs. So these people just get recycled from the government to industry, from industry to the government. Do you know any, any names of the people over the World Health Organization? No, but all you have to do is go to the website and look at their – you know, it's really easy to find out who these people are because you can go to the website, you can see who's working at the World Health Organization, and then you could follow their resumes and see exactly who they are and where they – you know, where they worked in the government, where they worked in private industry. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, 818. Uh, again, the website, ebonynewschannel.blogspot. Dot com. Uh, person who called in last four digits seven zero one two seven zero one two. Did you have a question? Uh, no, Gus, I don't have a question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for listening in, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Nero. Mr. This was your suggestion, Mr. Nero. Did you have a question, sir? <laughs> Greeting. Can Good I to hear heard? from you, sir. Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Banks, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, I missed the first five minutes, so I don't know if you agreed or disagreed with Gus's uh, definition of racism, white supremacy, but uh, after listening to everything that you've stated, it, it seems to suggest that there is indeed a global system of racism, white supremacy. Um, my question, though, would be, uh, do you have maybe a list of uh, medications that people take that we absolutely should not be taking? Uh, that no, that's pretty that's pretty broad because there are so many medications on the market right now. But the things that I really try to discourage people from taking, for example, they were trying to push this HPV vaccine onto preteen girls. And I really am trying to discourage people from getting all of these vaccines. And I, I, the flu vaccine, the H1N1, these vaccines, I would really strongly advise people to stay away from the vaccines that are coming out now. Big. Wow. So no, no drugs in particular, just the vaccines. Well, the drugs, you know, the thing of it is that it's, it, unless you have a particular issue, it's hard to say there are so many drugs, and it would be hard to just sort of give a list right now. For example, if you were HIV positive, you, I would not advise you necessarily to take those drugs, any, especially for any length of time, especially if you knew, if you know that those drugs could eventually kill you and probably will. So those drugs are very toxic. But the question that you have to ask for your, yourself anytime you're taking a drug is, are you willing to take the risk? But you have to know the risk, and this is the problem that I have with the pharmaceutical industry. So many times they don't let you know what the total risk is so that the doctor doesn't know and so that you don't know. For example, when I was practicing um, obstetrics, many people were take, wanted to take hormones, and they were telling us hormones were safe. But then we come to find out that hormones increase your risk of cancer and many other heart disease and many other things. So that's the problem with the pharmaceutical industry. You don't always know what the complications are because they don't always give you the information. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nero, and thank you for the uh, suggestion. Excellent, uh, excellent guest. Very informative. Um, person, uh, another person called in from Philadelphia. Last uh, person who called in last four digits, eight nine one seven, eight nine one seven. Did you have a question? Yes. What's up? Greetings. I do have a question. This is Abena. Um, oh. Hey, greetings. Um, greetings to you, Doctor um, Banks. Hello. Hello. So. It's a, it's a pleasure to, it's refreshing almost, sad to say, um, to hear you um, on, from so many different levels. One, I work in the mental health field, in the behavioral health field, um, and 
in terms of medications, you know, I'm just thinking of the Seroquils, the Respiradol, the Celexa, um, Trazodone, and things like that that um, I know also are used to do um, the same things you talked about in terms of opium and how it was used to destabilize people, family, and their lives and their lifestyles. The same way you talk about um, what they're doing in Africa and how they have um, – it's almost like the, the responsibility is always placed on the victim for um, what's happening to them. The people are dying from hunger um, and limited resources for basic needs, yet the story that's put out there and accepted by folk is um, that they're dying from AIDS, and of course AIDS, you, do, you, you did that to yourself because of your choice to be sexually active in a certain way. Um, I just see um, on a very basic individual, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking of the global, this global system of racism, white supremacy, one, first and foremost, um, and then just seeing as you're talking about it how it really sort of, quote, unquote, trickles down, you know, or flows down into the lives of, of individuals. I get the opportunity, if you will, to carry the stories, to share the stories, to listen to the stories, of, of individuals who have been um, so harmed by this system, um, how it's been designed, how people have been set up, um, and then and then forced to take the the total responsibility and blame for their condition. So that's the one thing that just kind of keeps reverberating. Um, as I'm listening and, and seeing and hearing and putting all the pieces together. And I needed to say that. So that wasn't a question, I guess, it's just like, ugh, which happens for me because of, you know, the work that I do and the stories that I hear on a daily basis, the way I experience it playing out even um, in my own life in terms of I'm in a process of working to counter racism in the workplace um, and to protect myself from acts of mistreatment. Um, the people who are causing the harm are the ones who are being constantly and consistently rewarded um, and sort of given a pass to continue um, their behaviors. And as I think about what you talk about in terms of Rumsfeld and in terms of um, Kissinger and, you, you know, how just kind of like having that resonate with how that same dynamic plays itself out, um, at least in my life, and I imagine the lives of all of us. One question, though, how have you been able to keep yourself safe, given um, what you know, the work that you're doing, the talking, the teaching um, that you've been able to do thus far, how have you been able to do it and keep yourself safe? Safe enough well, to, be able all, to, to be able to, to talk clearly and put the information out there. Well, first of it. all, this is, you, you know, I, I, I start the book talking about the psychological uh, issues that the psych, psyops, how it's a mind control thing. But I end the book talking about that it's a spiritual, we talk about the spiritual aspects of this. And, you know, we are all vibratory energy, and we all, you know, the, the thing of it is is that we can focus and we can work in their energy system or we can step out of their energy system and work on another plane of energy altogether. And one of the things that, that, I, that I'm trying to address is that, that, that not to work inside of their vibratory system because their vibratory system is about fear. Everything is about fear. And the, the whole AIDS thing is about fear. Now, you know, the, the economic system is falling apart, and they're talking about there's going to be another terrorist attack, because they, ha they have one note. It's violence and fear. And that's the note that they play. So you can go into that energy field, or you can step out of that energy field. And the thing that I'm asking people to do is to begin to learn how to step out of that energy field. And once you step out of that energy field, then they're, they're not really a problem for you. And that's the, that's the metaphysical and the spiritual aspect of this that people have to really begin to understand. This is a real, this is a spiritual war at base. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Abin. I'll, I'll see maybe uh, I have some other questions. I just stopped because there were a lot of people that called in. We have a little time before the program wraps up. I'll check other folks that called in. Um, that was another key point from the book when I was reading. You talked about how uh, in this system uh, they will set up things for people to be afraid of, uh, whether it's the war on drugs, uh, with the war on terrorism, uh, and you you are writing that AIDS fits right into that paradigm of ooh, be be afraid of of AIDS. This is the new boogie monster. Um, can you share a little bit about that? Well, one of the things I talk about is that you know we we in fact are energetic beings having a uh, human experience, which means that we're more they, the the people who run the planet want us to think that there are five senses only that the taste, feel, smell, etc. But one of the things that I, I was struck with, especially listening, there's a, a shaman in South Africa. His name is Credo Mutwa. And he talks about the fact that when the Europeans first came to that area of Africa, that Africans could often send information over distances without drums, that if something happened in a community, the people in the other community knew what was going on. So what they were talking about was, uh, ESP. And then he said something I found was interesting. He said they came and they started um, giving people vaccinations. And the people who had the vaccinations were no longer able to do these things. They no longer had the spiritual connection. And his mother and many of the mothers used to, uh, when the people came to vac vaccinate, they would either take the children to the bush or they would scarify their uh, their arms so it would look like they had the vaccine and they would leave them alone. And those people that weren't vaccinated seemed to be able to retain this ability to have this psychic phenomena that they were able to have. So I found when he was saying that, I said that, you know, I started thinking about all of the toxins and all of the poisons that they, they give our children, the mercury, the aluminum, the fluoride in the water. And then when I started really looking at all of these things, I realized that these were also poisons that would inhibit your ability to, to have more than a five cents dimension of the world, that the world is, you know, we have this, this huge electromagnetic system that we have the ability to have uh, communication with, and we are actually quantum beings, and we have quantum energy, and so I think it's fascinating that these people are giving, especially our babies, all of these toxins that really seem to block our ability to tap into our deepest recesses of our energetic system. It's really quite fascinating. Uh, again, our guest for today's program, Dr. Nancy Turner Banks, author of AIDS, Opium, Diamonds, and Empire. Um, those vaccines, um, you talk quite a bit about that in the book, and, and you even provide information about other uh, epidemics, you talked about the flu epidemic, and you had some, to me, it was it was startling, the information you had about the mortality rate for the individuals who took the flu vaccine as opposed to the people who did not take the flu vaccine. Can you share that with our audience? Yeah, well, I think one of the things that, 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 the, that they have done through the, the press is to make it seem that the vaccines um, are are, are just miracles and that people are going to, if they take these vaccines, they're going to survive. But one of the things that happened, I think during Spanish flu, is that what you're, you're referring to? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. During the early part of the, I think it was around the time of world war one, that was the first time they were giving people of the military, especially a lot of uh, vaccines. And, and what happened, they developed something that they, they claimed was they identified it as the Spanish flu, but those people who had had those vaccines actually were the ones who had the highest death rate. Now, the interesting thing was, is that the people who, um, were in the uh, regular hospitals had a much higher death rate than people who were in, say, the homeopathic hospitals. 
The people that were in the homeopathic hospitals, they only had about a 5% death rate where they had about a 30% death rate in the regular hospitals. Wow. Very interesting. Very interesting. Again, those vaccines, those vaccines. Um, when I, when I read, uh, yeah, I'll call you back. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello, I'm yes, here. Ma- yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Did you get to to finish what you wanted to say about the the vaccines with the uh, influenza epidemic? Yeah, that was that was pretty much I wanted to say about that. Oh, and you know what? It just came to me also because someone asked me about what other drugs that I would would um, not recommend. One of the other things that has happened over the last 10 or 15 years is that they are drugging our boys also. They're they're saying that any any boy usually that has some behavioral problems, they're saying that those children have ADHD, and they're putting them on drugs that are like cocaine. And so this is another – for parents, you have to be very careful – and I would really suggest that parents be very careful about starting their, their children on these drugs because these drugs are addictive. And we and they don't know what the long-term effects are going to be on the development of the boy's uh, brain and their development for their intelligence. Wow. wow. Are, are you seeing the same uh, disproportionate uh, prescription of these drugs to black children? Oh, yeah. Mm. Wow. Umar Abdullah Johnson, he's been on this program twice. He's a school psychologist. He has said the same thing uh, vehemently. Watch out for those drugs. Watch out for those drugs. Um, and the problem that I'm having also with this is that black parents have got to start of, of fighting for their children. They have, You know, I really understand, I call it, you know, the – we're we're sacrificing our children to the vaccine gods. You know how in the old days they used to say people would sacrifice their children to the gods. Well, we're why are we sacrificing our children to the gods of vaccines to the gods of the pharmaceutical industry? And, and I think I, I, it, it really is distressing that the the that especially in the black community, people are not challenging these things. Mm. Hopefully they will get you a book and they will uh, they will change their mind. Um, the website again, uh, full of great information. Um, the website is nancybanksmd.com. Again, nancybanksmd.com. Um, we have talked about uh, eugenics on this program quite a bit and and the legacy of Margaret Sanger. Um, how would you connect uh, eugenics? to what's happening with so-called AIDS? Well, I looked at a disease in the early part of the century that was plaguing the black community. It was a disease called pellagra. And pellagra was a vitamin deficiency. And it, it largely occurred in the South in sharecroppers and people who worked in the cotton mills. And it was because people weren't making enough money to buy decent food, and they were mostly eating what I called a white diet. They were eating uh, pork fat and corn pone um, and molasses. And and so it, the diet was deficient in a particular B vitamin called niacin. They didn't know that at the time, but they sent a doctor to the South who did an evaluation, and he discovered that it wasn't an infectious process, and only the people who had this poor diet got it. And and mostly it was black women. But because they were deficient in this one nutrient, they also developed a lot of infections and they developed they started wasting away and they developed diarrhea and they developed skin problems. And when you look at when you read about it and you look at it, it very much looks like what is AIDS today. But the the eugenics movement at that time, uh which was comprised of some of the wealthiest people in the United States, the Rockefellers, the Harrimans, they knew that it was not an infectious disease. They knew that it was a disease of poverty. And they had the research that this public health doctor uh, had done, and they suppressed that research for over 20 years and tried to continue to say that it was a disease, that these people were just filthy, dirty, subhuman and that they deserved whatever they got. 
And so there was no effort put to pay them more money or to give them the proper nutrition that they could have to uh, reverse the process. As a matter of fact, uh, John Henry Clark, one of our our uh, historians, our most famous historians, uh, stated that his mother died of pellagra because she was actually giving food to other people in the community. So, so that was the so, and then and then the whole uh, eugenics movement. That what they did is that they got doctors, just like they have doctors today, and they had the doctors to say that if anybody said that pellagra was a vitamin problem or a nutrition problem as opposed to an infectious problem, they would, you know, they would call them out and say that they were quacks and that sort of thing. So they were using the same strategy that they're using uh, for doctors today who are saying that the AIDS thing is not exactly what they're saying it is. And this was also part of the movement that they tried to uh, suppress the birth rate among blacks. And what they did is Margaret Sanger and her group hired Negro ministers and doctors to uh, try to to get black women not to have as many children. They call it the Negro Project. And it was mostly sponsored by these eugenicists, but they got black people on board. And they acted like they were really concerned about black people because they uh, couldn't feed their families, but they were really trying to suppress the population. And that's basically what's happening with the AIDS. We have all of these uh, movie stars and uh, professional athletes who have jumped on board this AIDS thing without a real understanding of what they're promoting. Uh, Would you, do you think it would be accurate to say that uh, AIDS is a continuation of the ideology of eugenics? Absolutely. I would have no, no problem stating that that's exactly what it is. Wow. It's just a little more sophisticated, but it's the same, it's basically the same strategy. Wow. wow. And I, I hope that was not lost because uh, I felt that was important. And you, you mentioned that earlier, that frequently uh, the people in charge of all this will get a black person uh, and put them out as though they are in charge to further cause confusion and deceive people whether it's uh, Joseph Mobutu uh, in the Congo or with the Negro Project, uh, and I really hope people are, are mindful of that. Uh, and you, you're saying, you're, are you seeing this with AIDS as well? Getting black people to go out and carry this message? Well, of course. I mean, what is the? There's a, a, a young brother who's a, an actor who has uh, started an AIDS clinic. Um, I can't think of his name. Very good-looking young man, and he's he's put a lot of money into this. You know, Oprah has really, she's been very active. Oh, and the other thing that Oprah has done is tried to promote this down low thing. Hmm. That's another issue, to to try to say that this down low, you know, that the men who have sex with men but actually are with women, that that is a phenomena that seems to be more unique to the black community, and that's another kind of myth that they've promoted, and that has been promoted on Oprah's show on several occasions. You you do not subscribe to that myth? No, it's a myth. Wow. Because you know, people the 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 thing that you have to the thing that you have to say is that black people have some if you think that this is a sexually transmitted disease, then you have to think that black people have some kind of odd sexual uh, encounters that are not that are different from the general population. And there's no evidence for that. And the other thing is this is how it started. It started as primarily a Caucasian homosexual problem. Now, we know that 20% of the homosexual community may be bisexual, which means that the community that we should have seen this in next would have been white females, not black females. So if the down low phenomena were something that was unique to the black community, then you know, sure that it might we might see that in uh, black females, but it's not a unique phenomenon. We know it's not a unique phenomenon to the black community. It's it's a cross racial kind of thing. Hmm. Wow. Um, I definitely want to make sure that I touch on uh, the fertility rates uh, 
um, because you talk about that in the book. And, and again, all of this under the umbrella of eugenics, population control, particularly non-white people, black people. Um, you in your book uh, wrote that white, the white populations, I guess in Europe and different areas, their fertility rates not increasing. That is a problem. I've seen a lot of that. Pat Buchanan and different white people have been talking about that. Uh, even a lot of material in this area of the world writing about how white people will not be the majority population in, I believe it's by 2050. Um, however, in Africa, even with all the poverty and, and all of the problems that are happening in the continent, uh, the population is increasing. Uh, the population is increasing, I think, in the book you wrote at a 3% uh, rate annually. Um, do you think that uh, the way AIDS is being manipulated, this is this is another tool to uh, decrease population of non-white people? Well, one of probably, but let me just say this about uh, the population of Africa. Um, the since AIDS started, the population of Africa started 25 years ago. It was around 400 million. It's doubled. It's about 800 million now. But they're depopulating those areas where the, the re they want the land and the resources. But the population agenda, it's not only against uh, people of color. It's also against everybody because I don't know if you've seen recently these tapes of Bill Gates. They've been on YouTube, on the Internet. Because Bill Gates is, is giving a lot of money for vaccines in Africa, primarily. Mm -hmm. but, but Bill Gates talked, he gave a public speech, and he basically said they want to, they're, they're couching this population thing under this uh, global warming business. And they're saying that they want to decrease the carbon emissions. But the way to decrease carbon emissions is to decrease the population. So they want to decrease the population by 15%. So he's saying he's, he's giving these vaccines so he can decrease the population. He says this in a public speech. Nobody makes a big deal out of it. So would they like to decrease the black population? They want to decrease all the population. And let me say this to the men out there. The sperm count of men is going down significantly. The sperm count that you have is a fraction of what your fathers had. And so we're finding a lot of fertility is not from the women. A lot of the fertility right now is male fertility problems. That a lot of the, the, the products that are being put into the atmosphere are, are hormones, are feminizing hormones. And these hormones and these chemicals are decreasing the sperm count in men. Wow. Wow. Do you, hmm. do you, uh, do you have some, I guess, suggestions for things that males can do to counter that? Well, one of the things I think is very important is um, that, that try to eat as organic food as much as possible uh, try to, to to find water that's as pure as you can get it. If you can put filters in your home or filters on your water, um, those are the the main things. The problem is is that everything is in plastic, and some of the things that leach from plastic are some of the problems. But as you know, that the the hormones that women use, the estrogens, the birth control pills. They're showing up in the, the water supplies of almost every municipal um, system in the in the country. So that it's becoming a real problem wow. because those some so some of those things it's almost impossible to get out of the water supply. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Um, you you talked about the male aspect of it. I, I definitely wanted to make sure because uh, you talked about this at the beginning. Uh, this is on page 277 uh, of your book. Uh, mm -hmm. You wrote that uh, the CDC mounted another perception management campaign by claiming that black women were now the fastest growing group of AIDS patients, conflating HIV with AIDS. What the CDC did not say was that young black women were also one of the fastest growing populations uh, of people using crack cocaine and crack cocaine use 
just happen to be an independent variable for the development of many of these additional diseases they were now claiming were also caused by the elusive virus, uh, page 277. Um, could you elaborate on that passage a little bit? Right. Again, basically what I'm saying is, for example, the, it, when you look at the, the, the studies that were done on women who are prostitutes, what you find is that the the women who take who who are prostitutes who don't take drugs have a very low HIV infection rate, but the women who are prostitutes who do take drugs have a very high HIV infection rate, so-called infection rate. So what what I'm basically saying it's not the the sexual act; it is the drugs that the women are taking that is causing the abnormality in their uh, antibody count. Wow. And and I guess I, I really wanted to make sure listeners heard this because I hadn't really heard anyone uh, make this claim that AIDS is not sexually transmitted. Hello? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Oh, none of the studies, you know, no, there's none of the studies show that AIDS is sexually transmitted. Studies, long-term, there was a long-term study done out of California, a 10-year study by Nancy Padian, P-A-D-I-A-N, and she looked at what they call non-discordant couples. That means one person is HIV positive, the other is HIV negative. And what she found is that uh, there, there, it would take, it would take years to to be in to to cause an infection. That's not a sexually transmitted disease. Then do you you notice that they don't talk about um, uh, hemophiliacs anymore because the hemophiliacs there was no. Uh, transmission between male and female hemophiliacs. And um, studies were done in Europe and in Africa, and all this, none of the studies show that, that uh, this particular, what they're calling this virus, was sexually transmitted. So that information is really not being put out there. But those studies have been consistent from country to country. Wow. Um... And again, is this part of the deception that this is not really being talked about in mainstream media, that you have quite a bit of evidence that would suggest that this is not sexually transmitted? Absolutely. Also, if it's sexually transmitted, for example, if you, for, for example, if the guy is HIV positive, you would have to find the HIV in his sperm, right? Cool. So 85 to 90 percent of the time, they can't find any what they're calling HIV in his sperm. So if his sperm is not having any HIV, how is it being transmitted? Wow. So that's what I'm saying. You've got to read, you know, unfortunately, the media puts out the hype, but you've got to read, and I must tell you, nobody has time to read these studies. Uh, but but the, the problem is, is that the media puts out a story, but the doctors really need to be doing their research because the doctors should be reading these studies. Just... You, as a doctor, uh, from your experience and doctors that you know, are they are they doing the research uh, to get this information about what's happening with what is no, wow. no, they're not. They all they know is somebody. They don't even know what an HIV test. Most of them don't even know what an HIV test means or what it is or how it's determined whether somebody's HIV positive or negative. Wow. <laughs> wow. 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 Okay. Um, you and you you already mentioned it. You you said that uh this is a this is a spiritual battle uh that we're engaged in. Um can you talk a little bit about uh you said the importance of, of watching your energy and, and the way that you your thought process, the way you think about things, the way you think about the world that impacts your health and how you can deal with uh illness. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I think is very important, um as I've seen it, because I'm a little bit older in the black community, is that the black community, um, before this, these drugs became such a big deal, the black community was a very spiritual and a religious community. And it was our spirituality and our religion that kept us together. Now, some people may not be, some people may be Christian or Muslim or, or other kinds of religion. 
but it was this belief in in a higher power and a belief in the strength of ourselves and our ancestors that kept us going and kept us here and alive and well for all of these trials and tribulations. And then think about it. Over the last two generations, when people have had more time and more money and more opportunities, we've had this devastating effect on our community where we have two generations now that think having drugs is normal and that we don't even sometimes recognize our children by their behavior because our children now have taken on the worst aspects of the dominant community. So part of the destruction of this community has been destroying the strong spiritual and cultural aspects that the community used for 400 years to keep us together on this continent. Wow. I think that that would even go back to what you talked about with AIDS. I, I think that would be a part of the plan that that spiritual disruption uh, of communities. Uh, would you would you say that's accurate? And, and I think that we have to look at it that way because, as I said before, these are you know we experience these things on a physical dimension, but these things are actually they're actually ways of of, of for example, if you make a, a community dispirited. Or if they no longer will think that there's another way of being. And sometimes when I talk to young people, you know, they they think, you know, the, the drug thing and the street thing and the hip-hop thing is the only way to be. They, you know, no, and, and, and no matter what you tell them about their history and their place in history, it's like they are stuck. It's like they have been convinced that that's the only reality. That's a spiritual crisis because they have been they have been enslaved into thinking that that's the only way of being. Wow. Again, our guest, uh, Doctor Nancy Turner Banks. Uh, the website again is Nancy Banks MD. Dot com, uh, or you can just click her name if you're listening at Blog Talk Radio. Uh, I had a couple more questions, but I did want to check because someone else called in. A uh, person who called in, 5896, 5896. Did you have a question for Dr. Banks? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, no, no, um, I was just listening in and uh, – I'm going to definitely do some, recent, do some of that research on the AIDS, HIV, the AIDS situation, because I didn't know that. He didn't know, didn't know what, what particular thing he didn't know? I didn't know that you, the way you were stating that how it couldn't be passed through sexual intercourse, if I heard you correctly. Mm-hmm. Okay, Correct. see, I didn't know that. Did not know that. And then the other thing is the doctors don't know how to read the test. I just had I had the HIV test done about two or three three weeks ago. So if they don't know how to read it, the very question makes me very suspicious. So that's all. Well, I the have. question, the 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 things that I raised, and I don't know if you heard the, the earlier, is that the test cross we we talked about earlier that the test cross reacts with seventy different things, and at the beginning of my book I list those seventy things that the test cross reacts with. And the other thing is that you you know in they it, because not one company says that you can actually use that test to diagnose somebody with HIV. So if you have a positive test, you have to take multiple tests. But then the doctor has to ask you questions about your your health history. For example, do you take drugs or or, or have you recently had a vaccine? Or have you recently had a, a flu or have you had a cytomegalovirus or herpes infection? Because all of those things could be something that would cross react with a test. And that's the point that I'm making. If the doctors don't realize that this test cross reacts with seventy different things and they see, oh, you have a positive test, they might say to you, Oh, you are HIV positive, and they they won't go any further. 
And that's the that's the problem with these tests, and especially with trying to, you know, they are really pushing these tests in the black community. You got to get tested. And the other thing that I mentioned, I I wanted to mention before I leave is that 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 pregnancy is one of the things that cross react with this test, and then they want to do the test in the, all the prenatal clinics. How crazy is that? Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Thank you for, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's all I had, Gus. That's all I had, Gus. I mean, this is Jan 365, man. I was, I was just calling in, and she pretty much has put a lot of things on my mind, so I'm going to definitely have to do some more reading. So I appreciate it, Doctor. Yeah, let me just, you know, you can go to my website. You can see my book. But there I, I there are some other websites that I'd like to refer people to. There's a website site called Alive and Well. And there's another website called uh, Virus Myth. And you can get a lot of good research that, that that is good for people who don't have a medical background. You can begin to read a lot of these. Uh, issues in in layman's language, and I think those are two good websites to start with: Alive and Well and Virusness. I will link those uh, in the program, uh, so they'll be included in the description. I, it was Alive and Well and Virus Myths. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, I'll make sure to link those um, with the program. Um, I guess to, before you before you uh, exit, I, I did want to get. You also uh, in, you end the book and you talk about alternative means uh, for dealing with what is called AIDS for folks who, who might have that uh, that ailment. Uh, could you share a little bit of that with our audience? The first thing I wanted people to to say to to know is that if they they get a positive HIV test, not to panic and and not to think that it's a death sentence. That's the worst thing you can do, and begin to to ask yourself whether or not you even think the test is positive because if if you're not if you're not uh, living a certain lifestyle if you're not doing drugs if you're not taking a lot of antibiotics or other kinds of things it may be a false positive test or it may be an indication you know the the way i say the hiv test can be used is it may be an indication that your 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 nutrition or your lifestyle or something needs to be corrected. You may have an underlying metabolic problem. Now, for those people who who go on to develop uh, AIDS defining diseases, those are most often people who have some kind of they're either doing drugs or they have some some kind of uh, issue in their life, but that they have to come to grips with. Now, each person, that's going to be an individual thing. But the, the, the tests that I think are more important to do is a test called the glutathione level, glutathione. And what they found is this particular nutrient is the, nu- the key nutrient that seems to be missing or low in those people who go on to develop, who actually go on to develop one of the AIDS-defining diseases. And it's really important because it's part of the way your body makes energy, stores and makes energy. So that is a test that I would ask the doctors to do. You can ask them to draw your glutathione levels. And, and again, for the African-American community, I would very, very strongly ask for people to, to know what their vitamin D levels are. And there's another uh, nutritional element called selenium that people need to make sure that they have enough selenium. And there are other things that I talk about in the book, but I just wanted to focus on those three and not overwhelm people. But uh, the last chapter in the book basically talks about the nutritional elements. Um, Someone else slipped in. They had a a call. Uh, I believe this is 818. 818, did you have a, a question? Yes, I do. There's one more thing I wanted to ask you about. Recently they came out with this publication. There was this big hysteria about it claiming that 49% of black females of a certain age were uh, 
herpes positive. And as soon as I heard it, I said, that's impossible because if you haven't tested 100%, how do you know what 49% have? And I'm in that age group. I don't have herpes. Nobody did a study anywhere where I'm at. So I wanted to know what your thoughts were on that. Let me just say this about a lot of viruses. A lot of, you know, some viruses, um, first of all, a lot of people have herpes. For example, if you have ever had a cold sore, or if you go out in the sun, like I have a, a friend of mine, we used to go uh, in the sun, and she would get uh, a herpes on her nose. And, you know, a lot of kids get herpes outbreaks on their mouth. So herpes is, you know, by the time people are six years old, about 70% of the population has been exposed to a herpes virus. So I don't even know the importance of that. It has no importance because most people have been exposed to herpes virus by the time they're adults. It doesn't, and because they're they're they're, it does, they're not saying which type of herpes, and so that is a that is a that is a re- result that has absolutely no meaning. Um, someone also they made a comment they wanted to clarify. Are you suggesting suggesting that patients? Uh, stop taking their HIV AIDS medication? No, I'm not suggesting anything. I'm suggesting that people use their common sense. I am not diagnosing or telling people to stop doing anything. People have to decide for them. This is this is part of what I'm trying to do. Take responsibility for yourself. If you think those drugs are helping you and you think if you believe this, what they're telling you, stay on the drugs. If you think there may be another way, then it's your responsibility to look into that and and find that other way. There are hundreds and hundreds of people who are alive and well 25 years later who have chosen not to take those drugs. So the, the key is, is that you have to begin to take personal responsibility for all of your decisions. That is the spiritual quest that you're on, and that's what I'm asking people to do. If you feel that you want to listen to what the system is telling you and you want to do what the system is telling you to do, then you can do that. But if you feel that there's another way, then you have to find it. But also, let me say this to you. Some of the drugs that they are putting people on are addictive, and when people start to come off of those drugs, they have withdrawal symptoms. And so they think that they're feeling worse because their their AIDS is getting worse. But they're feeling worse because the drugs that they are giving you, some of them have addictive properties. Wow. I, I think this uh, coincides nicely with, with what you just raised and I think is a big part of the spirit of the book. Um, and it begin chapter one, page one, you should never believe anyone, not even me. You can only trust your own research. If you just comfortably lie on your back and let people tell you everything, then you'll get some sort of answer, mostly the wrong one. This is quoted from uh, Dr. Kerry Mullis, a Nobel Prize winner. Again, this is uh, page one uh, of Dr. Nancy Turner Banks' book, AIDS, Opium, Diamonds, and Empire. Thoroughly enjoyed the program and the book. She uh, sent me a book. I am super appreciative, uh, and I would encourage folks, please go to her website. Her website, again, is nancybanksmd.com. Check out the book, and she has a lot of other great information on the website. Please check it out. Uh, We thoroughly enjoyed hearing from you, Dr. Banks. Well, Gus, I really enjoyed this time talking to you, and your audience is really smart, and they had some good questions. And I hope that they do read the book, and I hope that it helps people to begin just to look at the world in a, in a strategic way and to begin to understand how we um, fit into the big picture. Globally. Globally. I, I'm there 100%. Uh, again, Dr. Nancy Turner Banks, thank you so much for coming by, and uh, we'll definitely be in touch. Check the website, nancybanksmd.com. Thank you so much, and we'll be in touch soon. Good night. Good night. Have a great evening context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade, uh, Justice is not here. She's traveling, but uh, her email address, justice.asap at yahoo.com. Again, justice.asap 
at yahoo.com. Hopefully she'll be back uh, tomorrow. Um, oh, clarify, we, we do have a program tomorrow. Our uh, guest will be uh, Dr. Wesley Muhammad. Uh, he is a professor at the University of Michigan. He's authored several books. Uh, He'll be talking about how religion has been uh, corrupted uh, under the system of racism, white supremacy. The wrinkle with the program for tomorrow is it might be on this work, and um, it might be here at Blog Talk Radio, and it might be uh, with uh, War on the Horizon uh, with Irritated Genie. I have to double-check to see if things are all set and ready to roll uh, but there will be a program tomorrow, one way or another. It'll just be uh, either it'll be here or it'll be on his network. Um, what I can tell folks, if you want to tune into that program, check here first. If you don't see anything here, it will be on their network. So that means just go to waronthehorizon.com and uh, just click for the radio program. You'll see the link once you go to the main site. And uh, Gus T. Renegade should be there. So come here first. If you don't see anything, go to waronthehorizon.com, and you should be able to uh, hear the program tomorrow. One way or another, context of white supremacy with Dr. Wesley Muhammad uh, tomorrow. That would be Tuesday, October 5th. So check us out. You'll just have to be on your toes for where the program is going to air uh, tomorrow. Uh, also, I'll, since I have him here, I want to make sure I get that out. Uh, James365, he contacted me months ago and said he, he was coming to the Seattle area that uh, he, he was going to be visiting and wanted to perhaps hang out for a second. And I said, sure. Uh, the time that he came, and I don't even really travel a whole, whole lot, I was not in Seattle. In addition to not being in Seattle, I was crammed with programs, so I didn't even get an opportunity to reach out to say, hey, I'm not in Seattle right now. Um, but I, I did want to acknowledge that he's been a long-time listener uh, since we've been doing the context of white supremacy. Um, definitely appreciate his continued support. Hope he is not wasting his time. Um, also wanted to make sure that I get out uh, books. Books. I do have my wish list. Uh, at Amazon.com, just put in Gus T. Renegade, and you should be able to find my wish list. Uh, it is prioritized. I think the top two, the top two books uh, at the Amazon site are uh, Homosexuality and the Effeminization of African Males. That's number one. Uh, the second is uh, Paul Grant's book, Why Willie Lynch Must Die. Those are the two books that I'm trying to get. I'm trying to have uh, Mr. Grant with us on Thanksgiving Day, if I can pull that off. But I need that book. Um, so if you can, uh, anybody that's interested in investing in the context of white supremacy, those are two things you can do. Those two books, that would be great, super appreciated. Uh, and I would definitely enjoy doing a second program uh, with Dr. Baruti on the effeminization of African males, homosexuality and the effeminization of African males. So go to Amazon.com, Gus T. Renegade, see my wish list. That's one way you can support the context of white supremacy if you think what we're doing here is constructive and uh, a of some value. If you don't think so, don't worry about it. Um, let's see, anything else I wanted to share before uh, we get ready to go out? There was a CNN report. I told you all I wanted to be much better about keeping up with current events and checking information. And I, I've been making an effort to do that consistently. There was a report on C, not on CNN. It's, this was uh, from the BBC that was very interesting. I want to pull it up and uh, share that with you all before we get ready to uh, get out of here for today's program. If I can, if I can get it on my screen here. Um, let's see. I thought I, I thought I bookmarked it. I will see how cool my browser is in pulling up. Uh, Yep, got it. Bang. Thank you all for the MacBook Pro. See, I can do a lot more having a great computer. Okay. The article, this is, uh, again, from the BBC. This uh, was from October 1st, 2010. The uh, title is Lithuanian Blonde Island Plan Raises Eyebrows. Again, the title is Lithuanian Blonde Island Plan Raises Eyebrows. Um I'll read some. Perhaps you all will find it interesting. Uh, A Lithuanian company plans to set up a holiday island in the Maldives run entirely by blondes, the latest project in a growing blonde movement in the Baltics. But how legitimate is the latest sign of Baltic blonde ambition? 
What do you call a blonde who runs a business? A dab hand at marketing if she comes from Lithuania. Blondes in the Baltics have had enough of the jokes about being dumb. Now they want to show they are smarter than the gags make out with a growing blonde business empire. The Lithuanian company pronounced Ulala is planning a holiday resort in the Maldive Islands. The firm hopes to pull in the tourists by employing only blonde staff and offering direct flights to the island crewed entirely by blondes, including the pilots. Ulala is run and staffed by blonde women and already operates in 75 different business sectors, making products from computer software and food products to pop music. Racist idea? Ulala's blonde managing director, uh, I'm not going to pronounce this gentleman's name because I'll just, I won't say it correctly, uh, says she wants, or excuse me, this female's name, uh, says she wants to break the stereotype that blonde women are less intelligent. Our girls are very smart and they have degrees, she says. All of them want to do something with their lives. They have lots of business ideas. The island project was officially unveiled this weekend at a party with blonde dress code in a new nightclub in Vilnius, opened by Ulala. But the resort, which is meant to be opened in 2015, has been heavily criticized. When it was announced on the Maldivan News website, Minivan, in September, many readers condemned it as a discriminatory as discriminatory by potentially excluding non-white Maldivians. This is racist and should not be allowed in the Maldives, wrote one reader identified as Ablo. Local laws could make things difficult as resorts in the Maldives are required to hire at least 50% local staff. In Lithuania itself, which is a member of the EU, There is the question about whether stipulating blonde hair as a criterion for job applicant contravenes EU employment laws. Would older women with gray hair or men be eligible for a job? Question mark. Selling sex. Uh, The same female says that her company does not discriminate and welcomes all applicants, no matter what their gender, age, ethnicity, or hair color. But we find that women with dark hair work here. They are surrounded by all these beautiful blondes, so eventually they end up going blonde too, she says. Other critics call the company's entire marketing strategy sexist. They fear that using cliched sexual images of blondes to sell products simply confirms negative stereotypes. It's clear they are not selling the idea that blondes are clever, says Latvian journalist, uh, who is herself a brunette. They are selling the idea that blondes are sexy because sex sells. They have found their unique selling point, which is Baltic women and sex. Stag party culture. And again, this is from the BBC. This is not from some, you know, obscure website. BBC October 1st. All the company's products are advertised using images of sexy blonde women in improbably intellectual stations. An ad for Ulala's own brand of Coca-Cola, Dr. Welsing moment, an ad for an ad for Ulala's own brand of Coca-Cola, for example, shows glamorous, high-heeled blonde scientists concocting rather unlikely-looking laboratory experiments to make the drink. Another ad shows a board meeting of blondes who are applying makeup while discussing corporate strategy. When the PR campaign is offensive, whether the PR campaign is offensive or simply cheekily ironic, it does appear to be working. Ulala says it expects to double its annual net profit to $10 million this year and claims that over 80% of Lithuanians 
recognize the brand. Ooh La La's growing business is just one sign of a bizarre blonde movement in the Baltics which describes itself as liberation from stereotypes for blonde women. In May, a two-day blonde festival was held in, Latvian, in the Latvian capital, Riga, to cheer up a country hit hard by economic crisis. The event's organizer, uh, who is the CEO of a business and president of the Latin, Latvian Association of Blondes. Wow, <laughs> they have a Lat, Latvian Association of Blondes. Wow, told the BBC that the annual festival, which includes parties, a concert, and a march of blonde women through Riga, is meant to prove that blondes can be independent and show initiative. But judging from the overexcited reaction of some male tourists in Riga, female emancipation wasn't necessarily the first thing that sprang to mind. One young man visiting on a stag weekend was detained by police after drunkenly stripping at a concert on women, old town. The, blo- the Baltic blonde movement is certainly attracting attention, but it may also end up undermining the region's attempts to pull in more sedate tourists and shake off its rowdy stag party image. Again, this is from the BBC, October 1st, Lithuanian Blonde Island, planned raises eyebrows. Very interesting, very interesting. Uh, I'm going to support Mr. Williams, and I'm not hanging out, but I will give you all 10 minutes if you have anything to share, 10 minutes for any of the folks that called in. I am going to support Mr. Williams. So if you called in, your line should be open. I will give 10 minutes if you all have anything to share, and I'm going to play Mr. Williams' uh, commercial really quick uh, just to support counter-racism.com. Okay, yeah, I have a question. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? At counterracism.com, You can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. All righty. Now your 10 minutes begins if you have any questions, comments, anything you would like to get out. 10 minutes. Uh, what I was going to ask is the brother that's on this commercial, does he have his own show? Uh, the brother on the commercial is Josh Wicket. Uh, to my knowledge, he does not have his own show, but he oh. was a guest on uh, Cree's program a couple times. Uh, he has called this program before. He's on the Counter Racism Radio Network. If you listen to their uh, some of the radio programs, he's in that rotation. So I suspect if you listen to Counter Racism programming, you've probably heard his voice before. Yeah, I heard him before, and I've seen him on uh, Counter Racism television. I always wonder. Or was it? Yeah, and then did, and you just did, did, there was a brother brother back of the bus. Didn't he have his own show at one time? And I think you were on there. Uh, back of the bus and Gus started the cows in 2007 uh, at the okay. University of Washington's radio network. But suspected racist threw us off the air. Um, but he he does call into this program pretty regularly. He was a guest here too. I'm getting background noise. I'm getting background noise. Got to quiet that down. But we won't be hanging for 10 minutes. Quiet that background noise down. Well, I have a statement. I know that you read the um, article from, I think you said, BBC.com. I, I don't understand the validity of the blind women protesting the um, the business establishment that's open because they benefit from the mindset of the people that's going to visit. It's almost like it's a come up. Did you say the blonde women were protesting? 
Yeah, no, unless I didn't hear you correctly, I thought it was some blonde. Um, I thought they started a coalition and protest the uh, mindset of the people about blinds being dumb and the fact that they even opened up the, um, the resort. Did I hear it correctly? I don't think it was the blonde women were protesting. I think it was uh, – it sounded like non-blonde people were perhaps – saying that it was racist. Uh, the Latvian Blonde Association, I don't think they were protesting the uh, the resort. Uh, I think they were just saying that they did have such an organization. I'll double check it, but I don't think they were. I don't think blonde people had a problem with this. I'll double check it. Blonde, blonde people have a problem being perceived as dumb blondes, you know, all the random dumb blonde jokes and everything. But actually in white supremacy, when I think of blondes, I think of, the representation used to represent the ultimate white people. Like that was Hitler's whole idea of what an Aryan was. was you know, the essence of, of the perfect white person was the blonde look. And I've also noticed with the ramping up of racism, you know, the, the outward displays of it, especially since Obama got in office, among a lot of the uh, white nationalist websites and things, you'll find articles and posts about blondes becoming extinct and what they have to do to make sure blondes stay around and make sure, you know, you marry white and things like that. And like this fear of, of blondes ceasing to exist. So that that story just reminds me of that a lot. I have double-checked it, and uh, I'm still getting a lot of background noise. Like if you're – out doing stuff, moving around. If you could mute your phone until you're going to talk, that would be helpful because it's it's just very distracting and it's um, reducing the quality of the broadcast. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I rechecked the article and I'm still getting it. I'm still getting it. Uh, I don't know who that is. <laughs> at any rate, um, we're only going to be here five more minutes anyway, so you know, all good. Um, but, yeah, I rechecked the article, and they do have what I said, the, the Latvian Blonde Association, but they were not protesting this resort. They were, in fact, they were organizing the two-day blonde celebration. So they, they were all uh, all on board with this. They think this is great. This is wonderful. They didn't have a problem with this at all. Okay. I, 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 I misunderstood. I would like to say with with the guests that you had on today, I'm totally, my mind is totally blown. I mean, I always felt that the pharmaceutical industry isn't really geared towards health and wellness, but the bottom line. But, you know, thinking about the, the, what you're saying, what, what AIDS actually is and what it's being perceived as and the tools that the media, the tools that the media and various political, um, I, I guess, um, leaders, are um, using to to just put this mindset out that it, it, it's a, it's a disease of, um, I guess, people who are living in in a manner that may not be acceptable. It, it just, it's just amazing to me. And I definitely have to get a book. I definitely have to do some research on my own. And, and definitely have to conduct myself a little differently because um, this is warfare. I see my sword on it. My sword's on it. Yep, and I I think a lot of us are so confused we don't see it as warfare because we think warfare has to be direct violence with weapons and that we have to see our enemy and that they have to openly declare war on us. I've I've seen so many people supposedly, you know, because it's online, supposedly that claim to be black women talking about how black men have destroyed our community, black men have brought drugs in, black men have brought in AIDS and HIV. That's why I I really appreciate what she was talking about because it it shows what I already knew. She was just, you know, more uh, precise with it. But that most of these things come from white, white, the white supremacists bringing this into our community as a means of warfare and destruction. Marcella? Yeah. Okay. Two minutes. Two minutes. Are there any think tanks out there? I mean, I think we're a think tank. You know, we talk. You know, every time I listen to this show, I'm left with food for thought. I'm able to honestly make sense of the insanity that in which I live and try not to be immersed in. But, um, it takes more, more, I guess, more minds than just mine and a couple of people that I call in with 
I was wondering if there's any think tanks, and if if you, if you can't mention them now, if you could probably post them on your website. <laughs> Just think tanks, because it's going to take a collective mindset to be able to um, address and, and, and combat this. I think the best thing you can do is information you find constructive here, download it, burn it, to give it to friends so they're more informed. And then in your immediate community, you may be able to start groups, you know, of discussing things. But in the meantime, you got to be an army of one and do what you feel is constructive. Uh, that would be our 10 minutes. Bang. Uh, I guess I'll have the final word, and I have silence now. I don't have all that background distortion. Uh, yay. Um, my thought on think tank would be make sure uh, don't lose the importance of the second word in that, tank. I don't think of that as a tank as in a, uh, a, a something, an apparatus that can hold a liquid or something of that. I don't think of it in, in terms of uh, like a water tank. I think of it as a tank as in a means of warfare. That's what when white people sit down and get their think tanks. This is let's think of ideas to maintain, refine, expand the war against non-white people worldwide. That's what I think of when they have their think tanks. Um, and at, at the end of the day, their think tanks are about thinking of things to do that will benefit the white team worldwide. Um, if this is a think tank, I would hope if we're getting constructive information or ideas from this program, it is what am I going to do with this information? Not just, oh, that was interesting, that was fun, that was enjoyable, that Gus is crazy, or he has some funny guests or funny callers or what have you. It's what am I going to do with this information to oppose, counter, destroy the global system of racism, white supremacy? So if this is a think tank, I hope the thoughts lead to action. Action. Um, yeah, and I will I will end on that note. Again, you got to be on your toes for tomorrow. There will be a program. I'm just not sure about where it will be, but I will try and find that out as soon as possible. Uh, subscribe. If you do that, you'll get the information. Subscribe to the cows. The link is right here in the program, uh, and you'll get an email alert, or you can get it sent to your cell phone, or whatever the case may be. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to the broadcast. Uh, again, happy birthday, Khadijah. Please support uh, the website. Back of the bus is nonwhitealliance.wordpress.com, nonwhitealliance.wordpress.com. Crees is cree7.wordpress.com. Again, cree7.wordpress.com. And 818 is ebonynewschannel.blogspot.com. And they are all linked on the show page. So you can just look for uh, the titles and click and roll. Uh, our guest, her website, again, uh, nancybanksmd.com. You can go get the book and check out other information. I uh, want to thank her again for stopping by and sharing some time uh, on her Monday evening. Uh, we will be back tomorrow, Tuesday, October 5th, Wesley, Dr., excuse me, Dr. Wesley Muhammad. Thank you all so much. Shout out to Justice. Shout out to Justice. Context of white supremacy. We'll be back soon. Replace white supremacy with justice. Cows signing out. <laughs>